Grab your, your Bibles, your phones, and we'll pray as God speaks through this passage in Genesis. Let's pray. Gracious and loving Heavenly Father, will you speak to us? Would you show us? Would you give us of yourself by your Spirit as we hear your word this morning? And Holy Spirit, we pray, would you be at work revealing the Lord Jesus Christ in our hearts? Amen. Well, I want to start this morning by having us think about a few quotes around work. Um, So I've got a few quotes about work, so here's a good one. Uh, The only place success comes before work is the dictionary. Nothing will work unless you do. Luck is a dividend of sweat. The more you sweat the luckier you get. Nothing ever comes to one that is worth having except as a result of hard work. And then finally, with hard work and dedication, anything is possible. With hard work and dedication, anything is possible. Well, I wonder what you think about that. We're encouraged, aren't we, to work hard and to see that nothing comes free, and to be decent and hard-working members of society. Or or maybe you're retired and you encourage your children and your grandchildren to be decent, hard-working members of society. And you think, would would, uh, DIY be so popular unless there was pleasure in working for ourselves? And yet when it comes to relationship with God, we need to unlearn all of this wonderful, useful advice. And time and again, we need to remember when it comes to friendship with God, it is about trusting and not about trying. Now, I guess lots of us would say that we knew that, but think about what that means. It means there's no superiority or inferiority in the Christian life. That everyone is made right by God purely as a gift. But it also means that true and and lasting happiness can only be found in trusting God. Not in your dream house or job or car. That fullness of bodily health can only be found by Trusting God and looking forward to his new creation. And no matter how much we spend on on private health care and exercise and a healthy diet, only trusting in God is lasting hope. That means that lasting safety can only be found in God. Maybe you're an organizer and a a list maker and a a fretter and a would-be in controller. Only in God can we guarantee that ultimately things will work out the way that we need to. And otherwise, however much we plan, however hard we work, there are no promises on the outcome. And to find peace and security in God, we need to stop trying to do it ourselves and trust only in God. Stop trying, keep trusting. Well, it's all very well, isn't it, to say that. What does it mean in life? How do we learn trust? How do we grow in it? We're going to see that more as we look again at the life of Abraham. And do you remember, we've seen, haven't we, so many big things. God has made these amazing promises of people and a land and a blessing. The promise of himself. And yet we've not seen how that will happen. And we've seen Abraham do Amazing things, calling up the the trained men of his household and rushing off to rescue his nephew and beating these four powerful kings. But we don't know whether they'll want revenge. And we've seen Abraham trusting and moving to where God commanded. And yet we've seen him fearing and doubting and taking matters into his own hands. 
And is he going to keep trying? Or is he going to keep trusting? And we're going to see in this passage more about Abraham's faith and lack of faith. And what that means about God and his promises. And we're going to see, first of all, very clear, chapter 15, the call to trust in God. The call to trust in God. That's so clear, isn't it, from this passage? Remember what's happened. Abraham has, has come back from battle. He's beaten these four kings who will no doubt be out for revenge. He's turned down a blessing from the, the king of Sodom because he's hoping for God's blessing. And then verse 1 is so clear. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abraham. I am your shield. Your very great reward or your reward will be very great. Just what Abraham needs in the face of everything that's happened. And yet, Abraham says, Sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless? You've made me all these promises, but you've given me no children. A servant in my household will be my heir. Lord, you've made these promises, but how can I know you'll carry them out? And I wondered whether that ties in with your experience. Lord, I know you've made me these promises. I know everything you've promised to be for me and to do for me. All the amazing ways you've promised to change me. All the ways you've promised to bring me to your new creation, but... I feel so weak. Sin seems so powerful. My circumstances are so painful. How do I know that you can do this? And we need to learn from Abraham to trust in God. That he will bring his promises. That he can and he must and he will bring about his promises. And we're going to... See that in Abraham's life and the same call to trust in our lives. But we do need to remember as we look at this, there is something unique about Abraham, isn't there? Remember what's been lost as we get to this point. That humanity have lost their special place with God. Blessing and relationship cut off. And people have been alienated and separated from one another. Society fractured as people fight and, and argue and make themselves the best. And relationship with God and each other is broken. And how much we experience that day by day, don't we? And uniquely, Abraham was promised by God that his descendants, his offspring, his seed, they will be the one to restore these blessings, the rescue of everything lost, the hope for a world broken. And so when God makes this promise to Abraham, you will have an heir, your own flesh and blood. It's not just this kind of ancient Near Eastern tent dweller will have a big family. It's saying there is hope for the world and hope for us. And did you see what God promised? He doesn't just say, you'll have one heir. He took him outside. said, look up at the stars. And count the stars, if you can. So shall your offspring be. Not just one, but more than one. Many more than one. Apparently, if you go out on a, uh, a kind of clear night, probably... I'm not round here. I think it's that's it, Hawaii. They go to the mountain in Hawaii. But the most stars that you can see is about somewhere between 2,600 and 4,500. The most stars you'll see with your naked eye. And that, so that's how many stars Abraham might be able to see. Uh, but later in Genesis, the promise gets bigger. Not just the number of stars he can see, but the number of stars that there are. Not just one seed, but thousands and millions and billions. Because God is faithful to his promises. And then look at verse 4. The most 
important verse in this passage, one of the most important verses in the Bible. The verse that explodes all of our trying to be good. The verse that teaches us what the gospel is. That friendship with God is not about what we do. Abraham believed the Lord and he credited it to him as righteousness. Abraham believed the Lord and it was counted by God to him as righteousness. Let me read what Paul says about it in Romans 4. What then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather according to the flesh, discovered in this matter? If in fact Abraham was justified by works, as if he was friends with God by being good, he had something to boast about, but not before God. What does scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now to the one who works... Wages are not credited as a gift, but as an obligation. But to the one who does not work, but trusts God, who justifies the ungodly, their faith is credited as righteousness. Abraham did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he promised. That is why it was credited to him as righteousness. Abraham's not perfect. Genesis is really clear about that, isn't it? He's fearful, deceitful, lazy, hard-hearted. And yet the Bible doesn't hesitate to hold him as a great example for us. Because Abraham believed the Lord. And he credited it to him as righteousness. That at the end of the day, Abraham is a model because he believed God's promise. That he couldn't make right all of these things, all of these terrible things that had happened by his own hard work. He he couldn't be friends with God on his own account. Like building a tower up to heaven, God spoke and Abraham trusted. What is righteousness? Being counted as having thought and acted and behaved perfectly. That God's standard is perfection. That God demands that we be perfect like he is and we're not. We've all done and thought things that are wrong and have broken that relationship. And our only hope is to be counted Righteous by faith in Jesus Christ. A righteousness that is from him and not from ourselves. Sometimes we'll, uh, we'll talk to folk about membership here in the church. And we'll say, uh, we'll ask some questions. And one of them we ask sometimes is, how is a Christian different from being a good person? How is a Christian different from being a good person? And you think, well, outwardly, Maybe not that much. I mean, Christians are called to be good people, aren't they? And yet this verse shows us all the difference in the world. Because being a Christian is trusting God's promises. Not trusting in being good, but in what he has done. To trust anything else, our behavior, our church attendance, our family's faith. That's going to fail us. Abraham believed the Lord and he counted it to him as righteousness. And yet what happens? Well, Abraham asks God for reassurance. He believes God and yet he says, Lord, how can I know this? How can I grow in faith? How can I be more certain? And the answer is God's covenant promise. God's covenant promise. And that's one of those significant Bible words, isn't it? You know, you hear those lists of big Bible words. Covenant is one of them. A solemn promise. A guaranteed formal commitment. Unbreakable. Words that must be true. Reputations on the line. 
a pledge that cannot be broken. And as we look in Genesis 15, you think, what is going on? Well, I want you to imagine that I am making a promise to Becca. So I promise that if you cook the lunch, I will do the washing up. Okay, do you guys believe me? Do you believe me? Yeah, maybe. Well, look, let's make it more certain. We're going to make a covenant. I'm going to swear to you a solemn agreement that I will do the washing up today if you do the cooking. So I'm going to bring this to you. I'm going to show you what happens. So we've got some bits and bobs to show you. So this is what happens in Genesis. Abraham gets his piece of meat. I've got my piece of meat. And this is what Abraham does. He says here, look, we're going to chop this in two. And we're going to cut it up. And it's messy, isn't it? And you think, he did not have a fridge. He probably didn't have a metal axe, bronze age, bronze axe, and he chopped it in two. And he put one piece here, and he put the other piece over here, and then he said, come on up. Yeah. And we're going to walk together between these two pieces of meat. So we're going to walk together. Okay, you can go, go and sit down. And what he's saying is, if I break this promise, or if you break this promise, we're going to be like this piece of meat. We're going to be cut in half like this piece of meat. And now this is quite clean and clinical, isn't it? He got a joint of meat. He got these carcasses and he cut them up. Probably the Bronze Age, maybe his bronze knife and the drip of blood and the buzz of flies and the rasp of crows. If we break this covenant, may we face a violent death just like this piece of meat. That God makes an absolutely unbreakable covenant promise to Abraham. And through Abraham to us, the promise of a wonderful new creation. The promise of a glorious new people. The promise of blessing and relationship with God himself through his son, by his spirit. God's covenant promise. But did you see? Did you see who walked through the corpses? Normally, if you make a covenant like this at that time, both parties would walk through the corpses. Not here. Here it is God alone who walks through. When the sun had set and darkness had fallen, a smoking brazier and with a blazing torch appeared, the symbols of the presence of God, and passed between the pieces. On that day, the Lord made, the word is cut, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham. Abraham doesn't walk through it. God walks through it, keeping these promises. God is saying, this is down to me, and you can trust me. How often do we sin and fail and feel like we don't do what we need to do to walk closely with God? How often do we feel like the weak and unstable covenant partners? And does God give up on us? Because do, does God declare, you've broken my covenant? No. And you think, surely someone must pay for this failure. 
Surely someone has to be battered and broken and killed for the failure of those who should have been faithful to God. And just like God in this picture walks through the bodies and takes the price of failure upon himself, so God in the person of his son took upon a body that could be broken to take the price of failure upon himself. Right here is a picture of the Lord Jesus who was broken for the failure of his people. That like Abraham, we can have hope because we can be blessed because the Lord Jesus was cursed. That this is our encouragement to trust in God because he has done everything necessary to get us to his new creation. That he has sent his his son to be broken in our place. An unbreakable covenant fulfilled in the Lord Jesus. And yet then we we come on, don't we, to chapter 60. And you think, why come down? And the wonderful power of chapter 15 and then this kind of grubby little scheme to try and fulfill God's promises by human methods. And it is a total disaster. A couple of weeks ago we saw Abraham's failure of faith and now Sarai's turn to have a really bad idea. And rather than trying to become pregnant the normal way, Sarai decides to try a kind of a surrogate parent. There's a bit of discussion about how common this was in the culture, but it's clear this is not what God had promised. God had said, I will bring about your seed, your offspring, by my power. You just need to trust me. And Sarah says, let's just G him along a little bit. God, your plan's not working out very well, so... I'll give you a bit of a hand. Let me make it easy for you, God. Look, we've got all the pieces together, so I'll give you a little bit of a hand, God. And just like so often when we try and run ahead of God or replan what he's put in order, it's a disaster, isn't it? Sarah is wounded and lashes out. Hagar thinks herself better and is mistreated. Abraham just does what he's told and Like Adam doesn't do what he should have done in the face of his wife's terrible plan. And it's a total mess. And it leads to jealousy and bitterness and arrogance and cruelty. And a pregnant Hagar runs away. Only to be found in this kind of stunning personal interaction with God. And God has to step in directly to try and salvage Abraham and Sarai and Hagar and Ishmael. And this terrible idea sets off a whole chain of consequences that we're going to see over the next few chapters. Now you just say uh, at this point, maybe you're wondering why does God say go back to Sarai after this mistreatment? Why does God not say no, go and be free? Uh, Honestly, I'm not totally sure. To me, as a kind of 21st century guy, it seems weird. I think there might be two reasons that God cares about right order and submission in society more than our culture does. Also because the safest place to be is in the house of Abraham, the place of God's blessing. And beyond that, I don't really know. But the main point is really clear, isn't it? When it comes to receiving God's promises, it just doesn't work to try and do it ourselves. It doesn't work to try and add to what God is doing or say, God, you've got most of the way there, but you've missed a bit. Our only hope is complete trust in what God is doing. Anyone here like DIY? Anyone a DIY fan? A couple of people. Mm -hmm. No, not many people, actually. Um, So over the years, I have had a few DIY disasters. I put up some shelves that were like this, 
I put some hooks up, only to find that they um, ripped almost instantly out of the wall. Um, if you could just put your hands over your ears for a minute. <laughs> I did, I did twice manage to electrocute myself. What, what is the biggest DIY disaster? When we think that we can do it ourselves to get God's promises. What does that mean? Well, if you're uh, struggling to have children, please don't sleep with your wife's maidservant. But not surprisingly, The Bible's challenging the attitude behind this, that we can get to God's promises our way, our rules, and our hard work. And I think if you've been here as a a Christian for a while, the temptations are subtle, aren't they? What does God promise Abraham? Land, safety and security, a blessing. And the danger is when we think we can find those things for ourselves. One of the things I, uh, I quite like to do in life is imagine if we had a, a little bit more money or perhaps a lot more money, what kind of house we would have. And you could, there's quite a lot of options around here, aren't there? You look around and you think maybe we would get that one with the pool and the, the triple garage and the amazing kitchen. On the one hand, it's kind of harmless enough. But I'm starting to think that there's something that I can do to bring about ultimate safety and security and happiness. If we had a bigger lounge, truly all my blessings would be fulfilled. Now, it's it's great, isn't it, to have a, a place to have people back and be hospitable and they're a great blessing from the Lord, but the danger that true and ultimate happiness, I could do that. It's not wrong to live somewhere safe and secure and happy. We're really thankful. The danger is that we think in the here and now, I can get the blessings I'm promised in eternity. And here and now, we live in the period of waiting and trusting. We can do it in loads of ways, can't we? If I upgrade the car, that will bring the blessings I'm hoping for. If I just retire, I will get the rest that I need. If I work hard enough and do enough and be enough, I will get the blessings. And just like Sarai and Hagar, all it leads to is bitterness and disappointment. That the holiday isn't restful enough. That the house is never finished. The You get the new car and someone else drives a bigger and nicer one past you. And only in God's new creation is lasting blessing. And that's not even to say about seeking to get these blessings through the route that leads to sin. That's Sarai's problem, isn't it? I want this so much, we'll do this slightly dubious way about it to get there. And these chapters are such an encouragement And such a challenge. That God has done this in the Lord Jesus. That we don't have to do it. That we can trust in the one who has done it. An unbreakable covenant promise. That God has sent his son to be cut apart. To make sure his covenant is kept. We don't have to earn it. We don't have to work for it. That God has done it. And yet the challenge to believe that and to rely on that. Abraham believed the Lord and he counted it to him as righteousness. And may those words be true of us. That hope, community church, believed the Lord and it was counted to us as righteousness.